Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. Julia decided at an early age, girls are either beautiful or smart. The girl knew very well she could choose, and she chose to be smart. The example of her older sister Helen was in front of her eyes. Everyone around her admired her beauty. Her hair was light blonde, silky clean, her eyes mermaid green, a figure they call model-like. Helen from an early age was focused only on her looks. She read a lot, but it was fashion magazines with advice on makeup, diet and so on. And Valen's girlfriends were exactly the same. Julia thought they were pretty, frivolous, fools. The mother, who lived alone two daughters, had high hopes for the eldest. If you marry Helen, we'll live happily ever after. Julia, then was still a very young girl, studied in the fourth or fifth grade. The girl was frankly perplexed. How can one put the responsibility for her happiness and well-being on some other person? Did the mother, who had been burned herself, not make the right conclusions? Once Julia asked her mother directly, you married your father for his money too. And he left us, went to a younger and prettier, even and left nothing to you or the children, because she had a good appetite. And now you teach the tape the same thing, so that it is the same. Splash, nodded mom. Helen is quite different from us. First of all, young, and secondly, she is much prettier than me. And she has me. It was me who had to come to everything myself. And I'll give you a hint and teach you everything. It will be good for you too, if you listen to me. Julia only sighed heavily. Her mother was beautiful, kind, but too frivolous. Both her mother and Helen lived with rose-colored glasses on their eyes. They all dreamed of a beautiful life. They believed that looks were the determining factor in a woman's success. But that's about it. Julia differed from her peers in her character, always being pragmatic, responsible, farsighted. And she clearly understood that to achieve something in this life, you have to work hard. And the options that her mother and older sister had in mind, the rich male benefactors, were all unreliable, fragile, illusory. Helen jokingly called her little sister a nerd. Her mother was always trying to remake Julia, to impose her point of view on her daughter. The most interesting parent sincerely believed that she wished her child well. I'm worried about your future. Well, how can you not understand? You're beautiful. We got such. You got the best of me and your father. When you finish school, we'll find you a wealthy fiancé. Just don't be like that. Then like cheerful and smiling. No, thanks. After school, I will go to study economics. Julia answered. Well, do you know what the competition is? Helen always started to argue at this point. You either have to be seven eyes in the head there, or you have to have a good deal. Yeah, mom sighed. We can't afford commercial education. And you can't get in for free. But Julia, trying not to listen to the arguments of her sister and mother, strived for her goal. Day and night she sat over textbooks, looked for additional courses on the internet, mostly free, because her mother, who worked as a cashier in the local supermarket, had no money for her daughter's education, and her father almost did not participate in the children's lives, as he had a new family. No, he still transferred some pennies, but everything was limited to that. No communication, no support or help in difficult situations. Julia knew from childhood that he could not be counted on. The girl deep down wanted at least once to meet and talk to her second parent. It seemed to her that perhaps the character she went just in him because the mother and Helen Julia did not resemble at all. But he did not seek to meet his daughters, and Julia, she didn't want to impose. And it was scary to face indifference, or even worse, dislike of a native man. Her father was a businessman who owned a chain of stores. She had no time at all for student parties, going to clubs and other such entertainments. Sometimes, of course, she wanted to go out and have some fun. But the girl realized that every minute counted, her time was too precious. Besides, there was no money. Her mother tried to replenish her daughter's card with a small amount every month. Julia knew that it was a significant part of her parents' salary and was very grateful to her. It was not enough, very little. But still, it was the help from her mother that allowed Julia to stay afloat. Especially after the third year, when suddenly something in the university clinic changed, 
and students were obliged to pay for the dormitory. And before, you could live there for free. Julia saved money on literally everything. But she didn't have time. She knew that she was going to her goal, which meant that sooner or later everything would be fine. Everything will be as she had dreamed. But on New Year's Eve, there was an event that made Julia reconsider her plans and turned her whole life upside down. It happened at that hectic time when before the New Year students try to pass all credits in time to start the winter session after the holiday without debts. Julia was just preparing for a credit in economic history when she received a call from her sister. Helen's picture popped up on the screen. On it, the girl smiled widely and looked like a star. Julia immediately realized something was wrong. Helen would not call her at the third hour of the night. It's her. Julia is awake, studying for her exams. And her sister should be having her seventh dream by now. Mom's in trouble. Helen's voice rang through the phone. It seems that she was close to hysterics. Come over. What's wrong? Julia felt her limbs grow young and her stomach felt empty for some reason. Anxiety squeezed her heart ice cold, and a bus hit her with a rusty hand. What when she was alive? But it was impossible to get any intelligible answers from the Italian. She was already sobbing and sobbing into the two, dropping only a few insignificant phrases. Mostly they were wails about how she was scared and bad now. As if the trouble happened in the evening, but Alina was informed only now, just a couple of minutes ago. And she immediately dialed her sister. Of course, there was no talk about any credits and exams at that moment. In the morning, Julia took the first flight home. She was almost the only passenger at the bus station at such an early hour. Julia found her sister in a terrible state, her hair shot up, her face swollen with tears. In her arms, she held her youngest daughter, a very young Molly. Helen was already a mother of many children. Her eldest son Larry, then two girls, Christina and Molly. None of the fathers were involved in raising the children. Princes, sons of rich parents refused to raise offspring and bathed in pennies with the elements. With Helen they were just having fun, with nothing serious in mind. And that one kept stepping on the same rake on purpose to get pregnant in the hope of finding a happy strong family. If something happens to her, how will I be alone with them? Helen looked at Julia with confused eyes, as if expecting her to offer a way out. But Julia, she was ready at this moment to hit her sister unbeknownst to her mother. And she only thinks of herself, how it happened. They had a corporate party, and Helen is machine carrying her daughter. Drunk, I guess. They told me mom was crossing the road in the wrong place. Jumped out in front of that bus. The driver couldn't do anything. He's in shock himself. He's kind of in the hospital now too. He had a heart attack right there on the spot. Bye bye. By the time we got there, I got a call late last night and I called you right away. So mom's alive. Julia checked. That was the most important thing to her. What hospital is she in? Morozov's. Julia jumped out of the house and called a cab. He seemed to be making good money. But all his property was prudently written down to his new wife so that his ex-wife and children would have no claim to anything. It looked ugly, petty, even mean. In theory, Julia should have been just as resentful of her father as her mother, just as Helen was. But Julia had a dream. To study economics, start her own business, and one day meet her father on a case. A joint project, a lucrative contract, something like that. Let him see what his daughter had accomplished on her own, without his help and then maybe they can talk on equal footing. And Julia achieved her goal, she got into the Faculty of Economics, where she was so eager. How happy she was when she saw herself on the list of enrolled. Screamed right in front of the computer monitor, jumped from happiness to the ceiling. She went crazy. Helen came into the room with little Larry in her arms. She had recently become a mother and given birth to a son by a rich man. He paid child support, but he did not want to communicate with his mother and Larry himself. Needless to say, these alimonies were pennies. Standard scheme of great earnings, most of the income is hidden. Helen was just like her mother, even in an even worse version. But she was not going to give up and continue to dream of a prince, 
who will surely sooner or later solve all her financial problems. Her mother supported her eldest daughter in everything, adored her grandson. This is not surprising. Julia also gladly fiddled with the baby when she had time. But the girl did not understand how it was possible not to draw conclusions from what had happened. Wasn't it clear? The plan is not too good and often fails. It was time to choose another option. But no, Helen still hung out on dating sites, looking for bigger prey. I got in, Julia explained her strange behavior to her sister. Wow, cool. What, you're going to the city from us now? You're going away to study. Julia and her family also lived in the city, but in a very small, remote from the regional center. Gray three-story houses, whole streets of old wooden barracks, a huge private sector. Julia's university was located there, and everyone called it that. Her mother, too, was happy to hear about her youngest daughter's enrollment. She had never hoped for such a thing. As it turned out, thought, let the little one, to show off, and when she realizes that nothing worked out, we'll go in the footsteps of her parents in the supermarket for the cash register. Well, and we'll think, finally, over the words of more experienced relatives. Realizes it is necessary to look for a rich and reliable man. And here's how it turned out. She did it. Good for you, daughter. Mom hugged Junior. I'll help you in any way I can. I'm sorry, I can't send you a lot of money, but at least a little for food, for housing, for being. Again, you need to dress nicely. In a big city, there's a better chance of meeting a decent man. Mom, you smiled at Julia again. She was touched by the fact that her mother supported and understood her, and even offered to help her. Julia knew. It's not easy for a mother to get that money, but she's willing to help her daughter while she's still a student. And that's priceless. Julia had a new life. She was given a room in the student dormitory, but not a separate one. The room had to be shared with two girls, but the roommates turned out to be very nice. They both studied at the Pedagogical Institute. Both, just like Julia herself, were focused on their studies and work. In general, the girls had a lot in common. With one of these neighbors, Valia, Julia even became friends. They kept their relationship even after they graduated from each of their universities and moved to rented apartments. Julia liked her studies, she was convinced in the first year that she had chosen the right direction. She found economics easy, the lectures seemed interesting, and term papers and tests were incredibly easy. Julia even started earning money. It turned out that people are willing to pay a lot of money for essays and projects. Big it is by Julia's standards, of course. The girl had to work part-time and study a lot. She needs to get there as soon as possible. She has to realize she's with a loved one. At the hospital, Julia was told the terrible news. Mom's gone. She had just recently passed away. At the moment when Julia rushed to the clinic, everything happened in the intensive care unit. The doctor then said that there was no chance of a good outcome. The injuries were too serious. And Julia would not have been able to say goodbye to her mother anyway. She was in a coma. And still the girl fed herself for slowness, for not supporting her mother by the hand. While she was still not, Julia was signing some papers when she received a call from Helen. She had been informed by someone on the nursing staff, and now the older sister was in a state of near panic. It had been a difficult time, arranging the funeral, trying to bring the sister who was supposed to take care of her babies no matter what, and the gradual realization of the terrible fact that the nearest and dearest person in the world was now gone. Just no, that's all. The father did not show up at the funeral, although he could not have been unaware of what had happened. This man did not even call his daughters, did not try to understand whether they need his help. Probably thought they were adults. They were both over 18. So legally, the father was no longer their debtor. He paid child support until his daughters came of age. And there was nothing more to expect. It was then that Julia realized that she would not meet and communicate with this man, even when she reached the heights of her career, he didn't need Lenka and Mama, and they didn't need him either. No resentment. No. It's just that Julia suddenly realized that her father is a complete stranger to her. They may look alike in some ways, but he's a stranger, just a stranger. And that says it all. Helen, on the other hand, is a stranger, and she needs support. Helen cried nonstop for days. 
Julia didn't stop her, let her cry. It would make it easier for her. While her sister was dealing with her grief, Julia helped her with her nephews. The little ones made her smile even in such a terrible situation. It was impossible to look indifferently at their funny games, to listen to their cute babbling. Nephews, like nothing else, showed Julia life goes on. Julia could not stay long with her sister. Winter session. Helen had already recovered a bit and even started monitoring dating sites again. Now she wanted even more to have a supportive adult by her side. Her mom was gone. In spite of everything, Julia passed the session with honors. That meant an increased scholarship. This money would not even be enough to rent a room for a month. The dormitory became paid because it was necessary to eat, dress, and pay for transportation. Julia tried to combine her studies and work in the cafeteria. It turned out to be impossible at once a lot of passes and debts were accumulated. As a result, the girl did not even get admission to the next session. Expulsion loomed ahead. Teachers took into account the previous merits of the girl and went towards her. But she still failed. The only way out was the transfer to the correspondence department. Only here's the catch budget places were all taken. The commercial option cost a fabulous amount of money for Julia. The rector offered a way out. One day he called Julia to himself and offered her the only, in his opinion, suitable option. I know your situation. I wouldn't wish it on an enemy. So began the conversation a man who always reminded Julia of Carlson. Just as good-natured, full and short. Student, you are diligent and promising. Such a one wants to help. That's why I'll close the session for you, no matter what. Let us draw the lines of the movie. And you take a sabbatical for a year. I'll help you get a job for family reasons. Raise money for school. You'll make it. You're a man of determination. And then when you stop, I'll help you with all the details. What do you think? Julia thought about it. She didn't want to interrupt her studies. On the other hand, what other options did she have? The session is not passed, that's for sure. So, expulsion. And where to go? to go home to her parents' apartment. So there's already a new suitor living there, a young and kind of nice guy, Stepan. Unlike the previous aluminum suitors, he's not a rich major. The guy works at a construction site, working from dawn to dusk, earning money. Seems to love Helen very much and has taken in all of her children. Maybe they'll actually have a family. Julia is completely unnecessary there right now. And she doesn't want to live with her sister. No, Julia loves her very much. She is the only person in the whole world who can be related to her. But still Julia is used to peace, solitude, freedom. And there's a family with many children. You can't do that there. And after all, she doesn't want to leave Orkovsky. It's a big city. It's beautiful, spacious, interesting. Here there are more prospects for work and study. The urban type settlement, where Julia spent her childhood, was associated with rage and hopeless longing. No, she didn't want to go back there at all. You know, I'll probably take advantage of your offer, Julia smiled at the rector. What a smart girl, asked the man. You're good, you'll do well. Just don't forget to save for your studies. Be sure to come back to the university in a year, we will be waiting for you. Deal, it's a deal. Thank you very much for the offer. That same night, Julia started looking for a job she urgently needed money, just to survive, to buy food, to pay for a roof over her head. The most effective motivation of all. It turned out that it was simply unrealistic to find anything close to the desired profession for a girl with an incomplete university degree. Julia was rejected everywhere. Employers did not even consider candidates without a diploma. The girl realized that she could show herself at the interview, but it did not even come to that. After a couple of days of fruitless searches, Julia realized it was time to part with the dream of working as an economist, or rather, to postpone it until better times. In the meantime, it is necessary to find something. When the bar was lowered a bit, things went better. Julia found a lot of vacancies, waitress, cleaner, salesman, but the wages were meager. No, it would be enough to live on, especially if you save money. But Julia had to save up for a year of schooling. With those salaries, it was impossible. And yet Julia needed a job. 
Immediately, she chose the path of a waitress in a bar in the city center. The arguments for this place were enough. First of all, there was extra pay for night shifts. Secondly, tips were very helpful, sometimes even very generous. And thirdly, the last job gave Julia the opportunity to write term papers and tests to order. And an extra penny in the piggy bank and brains are not idle. Total pluses. Work in the bar Julia even liked. The team is friendly and friendly, the bosses are loyal. The audience is decent. It was a rock bar whose owners cared about reputation. The atmosphere here was controlled. Undesirable elements were kicked out of security and never allowed in again. And another, and another. Local band musicians and performers and visiting guests gathered here every night. In general, live music. And it was beautiful. Julia listened to the musicians' performances with pleasure, singing along dancing. This in the bar was only welcomed. Going to work was like going to a holiday. In the bar, Julia finally understood the meaning of this popular phrase. Of course, with a waitress's salary, there are a lot of urgent things to do. Julia in parallel was looking for another job, more highly paid. But the girl knew even when she had to quit, she would come here to visit, just to be in this amazingly warm atmosphere. The rock bar and new friends helped Julia through her grief. Of course, the longing for her mother did not go away, but the girl was finally able to come back to life and believe that there are still a lot of good things ahead. It was in a rock bar that Julia met James. One day the host introduced the guests to a new rock band, which appeared just a couple months ago. James was the bass player, but not only that, he was the one who had the idea to create this band. He was the one who wrote the songs and the music. Modest, always kept in the shadows, but continuously observing all the behavior of the band members, the reaction of the audience. James was the main man in the crew. Although on stage most of the attention was drawn to the lead singer, you could feel it. It was noticeable from the first glance. For some reason Julia immediately singled him out and reached out to him. She did not recognize herself. Julia realized that she was not in a position to fall in love and have affairs. She was focused on her career, on her studies, on her recovery at the university. She couldn't be distracted by all this, she couldn't be distracted. And yet, James did not study and did not flirt with waitresses, did not talk to anyone first, he was serious, focused on his work. Perhaps that was what bought the girl off. James was very much like herself. James began to appear often in the bar, sometimes with a group to work sometimes just in the company of buddies to relax. Of course, they soon got to know each other, but he still acted kind of aloof, didn't show open sympathy. Sometimes Julia caught his eye though, but James would immediately turn away and talk to someone else. And Julia wanted him to pay attention to her, to compliment her, to give her signs of attention, as visitors often do. And then Julia would let him know that she was interested in him. One day in the company of James was a girl, this representative of the beautiful half of humanity came with him before, but they were just friends, girlfriends, other members of the group. This one was clearly something between us and James. They didn't kiss or hug, nothing like that, but sometimes they exchanged tender glances and smiled very warmly at each other. Once she laid her head right on his shoulder and James, casual, cold, and even stern, stroked her hair in a natural and very gentle gesture as if she were a kitten. A very unpleasant feeling was beating in Julia's chest from behind the collar. She recognized it immediately, of course, it was jealousy. With surprising scrupulousness, Julia began to pick out her rival's flaws. Too thin, not even pretty either. It's a nose, long hair, a little too liquid. Anyway, how could this madam be as good as Julia? For the first time in her life, Julia seemed to feel smug about her looks. Nature had endowed her, like Helen, with beauty. Julia had heard many compliments from others about her figure. She is tall, slender, long-legged. Her friends generally advised her to try herself in a modeling agency. Only this work was Julia was not to Julia's liking. Well, she did not know how to show herself, even somewhere that humiliating it considered it. And here, despite such impressive external data, the rival Julia was such a blue stocking. 
In general, there was nothing outstanding in James's companion, not even an eye to catch on. Nevertheless, he clearly had very tender feelings for her. Her presence made him happy. Julia watched James carefully and could tell that he loved his companion. It was painful, thanks to the girl that is. So to James Julia had made up her mind, decided to do something she had previously considered unacceptable to herself. Her shift was coming to an end, but per usual she stayed late to help a waitress friend serve tables on a Saturday night. There were a lot of patrons. Julia waited for an opportune moment. She even had a little drink beforehand for courage, to feel more confident and relaxed. James stood up and headed for the exit. Someone called him. The music was blaring in the bar. It was impossible to talk on the phone in such an environment. Everyone went outside, to the porch of the bar, or to the smoking room. James chose the street. Julia followed him like a shadow, now or never. The obnoxious girl who had been sitting next to James all evening stayed at the table. She chatted merrily with his buddies. You could see that they had all known each other for a long time. Probably a long and serious relationship. And yet still Julia will try otherwise. Otherwise, she'll regret later that she didn't even try. James stepped out onto the porch. He paced the square in front of the bar, patiently explaining something to someone. Julia watched him through the large window on the door. James was not smiling, not joking. Did he see the conversation was serious or unpleasant? It didn't matter. Julia would still approach him as soon as she did. James pressed reset and was about to go back to the bar, but Julia came out to meet him. Luckily, they were alone on the porch at that moment. Hi, Julia smiled at him. James looked at her with interest. We've said hello, and I think we already have. Julia nodded at me. I need to talk to you. James immediately stopped, tuned into the conversation. All his appearance showed that he was ready to listen to his interlocutor. He could have brushed her off or shown irritation or displeasure. But James looked at her with his dark and intelligent eyes and waited. I like you, and I've liked you for a long time. Julia decided to get right to the point. I don't know how to explain it. I'm magnetically attracted to you. It's never happened to me before. Aya, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with all this. Julia lowered her eyes. There she'd said it. What's next? James was probably just now finding the words to stitch her down as politely as possible. He probably was. Julia suddenly felt unbearably ashamed of her action. Why had she reached out to him? How could she look him in the eye after all this? James comes to the bar a lot. And then Julia felt his hands on her shoulders. A gentle touch, as if she were some incredibly fragile vessel. Julia, the name itself, as it escaped James's lips, sounded like beautiful music to the girl. Julia, I couldn't even imagine such a thing. James looked at her and smiled. He so rarely smiled. His eyes. The girl could see it clearly. They shone with happiness. Sincere, genuine. What's going on? Is he happy for her confession? Instead of words, James kissed Julia. The girl felt dizzy from it all. He was hugging her. More precisely, even held, because the girl's legs were literally under the painting kissed. Then he stroked her back and head, gently pressed her against him. I've been watching you for a long time too, and I'm attracted to you in the same way. Then why? I didn't even notice it once. I thought you didn't care. I didn't want to embarrass you. I don't. Anyway, I'm older. Older for you. I thought you were attracted to other guys, brutal, successful. With your looks, anything's possible. You're beautiful. You're unreal. You even inspired my song. Didn't realize I'm an Olympic princess. Is that about you? No, Julia confessed. It's a very beautiful song. I love it. I didn't even realize it came from you. Oh yeah, that's right. And that girl who came with you. Are you two together? We are. James couldn't help but chuckle. Together. Ever since my parents brought me back from the hospital with a pink bow and told me that Svetka was my sister. So she's your sister. Julia laughed out loud. I thought so. That's why I decided to have this conversation today. Sister, sister. James held Julia tighter to him and breathed in the scent of her hair, just passing through town. 
She's been married a long time, living far away with her husband. She misses the brotherhood of her troublemaking brother. Julia and James started dating. Turns out he's been sympathizing with the pretty waitress all this time. Why didn't he make any moves on her? I was going to. But later, when he's a little more cash flush, he had a clear attitude in his head. Girl, I'm interested in losers. So far, there was too much to do with the band, organizing performances and so on. But the guys were already starting to earn money from their songs. The prospects were looking good. And oddly enough for a rock musician, was James shy around girls? No, he had a lot of friends with whom you can chat, laugh together. But Julia, she evoked in him a very special feeling, and that made James, used to performing in front of hundreds of people, cringe. But Julia made the first step, thus shattering all of James' doubts. And now they're together. James himself suggested moving in together. They decided to choose Julia's apartment. Convenient location, adequate cost, cozy room. So it was James who moved in with her. But he immediately took upon himself the payment of rent and minor repairs, which every dwelling needs from time to time. And it also turned out that James is an excellent cook Julia's culinary talents. Just pales in front of his skill. James, as befits a creative person, created real masterpieces. Whether in the recording studio or in the kitchen, he was gentle, sensitive, and attentive, fully immersed in his work, but not forgetting about his beloved. They talked a lot, often went for walks, sometimes they discussed the next song together. It happened that Julia would suggest to her beloved the necessary phrase or words. He happily grasped the idea, and then the girl felt proud of herself. Well, how? Participated in the creation of a hit? Julia completely dissolved in her feelings and new sensations. Before meeting James, she did not know what it is love for a man. She had no time for that. First, studying hard, then trying to survive. It turned out to be so pleasant to be near a man who embraces you, interested in your mood and well-being, looks at you with admiring eyes, as at some princess, and melt from the touch of warm, strong hands. Knowing that he, this tall man with black eyes, would do anything for you, Helen didn't approve of her sister's choice. As always, she had her own yardstick. He's poor, he doesn't even have his own apartment. Again, no steady job, no business. He's a musician, he's got his own rock band. So what? Who needs them anyway? There's a lot of these one-day bands out there. We don't know if they'll succeed. I think you got the wrong guy. With your looks, you shouldn't do that. It's okay with me. I have three kids. Who needs me? So I'm content with what fate gives me. I don't complain. But you? Julia didn't expect her sister to understand. They were always too different. But Julia didn't need understanding. She was happy, she was loved. She had someone close to her. Yeah, he was going through a rough patch. But James tried, went to his goal, worked hard, looked for the right contacts, planned something. Julia supported him in all his endeavors, and he appreciated her devotion. Many times he said that he was grateful to fate for such a gift, for her. One day James undertook a rather risky endeavor, inviting a famous rock band to Orkowski. It was planned that his band would perform as a warm-up act for the famous musicians. This event was to increase the popularity of the band James. Well, and in general, the organization of such concerts is a way to earn good money. But something went wrong. Not as many people came to the concert as planned. There was a big rock festival in a neighboring state. James didn't take that into account. Or rather, he found out about the festival too late, when everything was already in full swing. In general, James went into a big disadvantage payment of musicians' fees, rent of the hall and equipment, tickets for the rock band, promotional activities, all this was paid off only half of the money from ticket sales. The concert itself was great, but James had huge debts that had to be closed as soon as possible. But with what? It was hard for Julia to look at her lover, during this period he looked confused, anxious. I wanted to help him at least something. But how? Where did Julia get the money from? James took out a loan, but it was just a drop in the ocean. His friends helped him, the situation improved, but the debt was still quite substantial. And then, 
Then Julia offered to help. She had savings, money she was saving for her studies. Not much, of course, but still. In addition, the girl did what she had been against for a long time. She took out a consumer loan. These funds were quite enough to close the debt. From where? Surprised James, when Julia handed him several packs of new crispy bills. Well, just out of the blue, my debt was paid off. Plus the insurance. Finally paid off the cell phone case money, the girl lied. She knew. If she told James the truth, he'd never take her money. And so it wasn't like it was the last one that came in by accident. Thank you. James hugged Julia tightly. I'll pay you back. You'll see, we'll be famous soon, and I'll pay it all back. James paid the debt and continued to develop the band. Julia slowly paid off the loan. It was no longer possible to save for school, and in general, the salary suddenly became much smaller. The bar had fallen on hard times. It was good that James bought groceries and paid the rent. That is, he took the main part of the expenses on himself. James' income came from a few corporate gigs and the occasional part-time job. Unstable earnings, but still does not dry up, and the stream is empty and then thick. Julia, not caring about the financial side of their relationship, she enjoyed James' attention, bathed in his love and care, and generously gave him tenderness, love, support. Julia tried not to think about the future, but not to recover in the university this year will do it next year. Nothing to worry about. She still had time. The most important thing is that he, James, is there for her. Julia didn't know she was capable of such feelings. And then James disappeared. No, he didn't run away from Julia. Nothing bad happened to him. It started out as a business trip. You can imagine. James grabbed Julia by the shoulder and even shook her a little. His eyes burned like two bright spotlights. You can imagine. I was invited to Germany to write music for a band. They found me on the internet, and they liked it. And now I'm invited. Julia couldn't believe her ears. She knew the band James was talking about. They were very popular musicians, touring all over the world. And they'd noticed James. They're offering him a partnership. Unbelievable. I'm going to have to go away for a while, James continued. Do you realize what that means? Julia nodded. She understood the money, the fame, the dizzying opportunities for James to grow and develop as a musician. Useful acquaintances and connections. James would get things he'd never dreamed of, but it looks like they're going to have to part ways indefinitely. After all, James clearly said I have to leave me, not us. The packing started. James had a lot of things to sort out. First of all, finding a replacement. Someone has to play in his band in his place. Temporarily. While he was away, of course. Secondly, James had to apply for a passport and visa. Thirdly, packing. In all the hustle and bustle, he seemed to have forgotten all about Julia. James was too enthusiastic about the upcoming changes and prospects. The girl looked at him and realized he would forget about her. Forget about her. In another country, muted by new impressions, excited by work and success. Perhaps James would even find someone there. But James, he hugged her so tenderly in the evenings, so sincerely assured her that he would miss her. Time will pass quickly. And then there's the video link. We'll be in constant contact with each other. At least I'll make some money, finally pay you back in a decent way. I know how much you need that money. Maybe we can even buy an apartment. My band will get bigger. I'll gain invaluable experience. I'll know how to do things. Everything's gonna be fine. James truly believed that. Julia saw it. He wasn't lying, he wasn't bullshitting. But something told the girl that everything would change as soon as her beloved was abroad. It's just that James himself doesn't realize it yet. That's how it turned out in the end. At first James called every day, as promised, telling her how to settle in at the new place. Everything thrilled him, the experience overwhelmed him. And then he suddenly dropped off the radar. He just disappeared. He didn't call or answer Julia's calls. Long rings steadily ended with the message that the subscriber, apparently busy and therefore cannot answer. Julia was alarmed at first. I thought that something had happened to him, something terrible, irreparable. But soon she saw a fresh performance of that band on the music channel. James was with them. 
He was very different, mature, and even more serious than usual. I mean, there was nothing wrong with him. It's just that he'd apparently decided to start a new life and cut off all his old ties, including forgetting about her. And Julia? At first, the girl still hoped, waited for him to call, to explain everything. But James disappeared completely out of her life. Julia made it a habit to watch the music channel every day. Every once in a while, she'd see James. He was never the center of attention, but he still got in the camera lens sometimes. And quite often the girl next to him was the same girl, either a makeup artist or the band's costumer. Beautiful, bright. Apparently, there was something between her and James. Julia was desperately jealous of James, both of this girl and of her lover's other potential husbands. She was hurt, hurt like she had never been hurt before, and also hurt and scared. Scared of being alone again without the support and warmth of a loved one. An unpleasant mixture of feelings and emotions. And there were other problems, more pressing. Moneylessness. Julia could barely make ends meet. She had a tiny salary and a loan. Eventually the bar went bankrupt. The new owners bought it and set up Julia's coca lounge. She had to quit, like all the other employees. Another blow. Julia had special memories and feelings connected with this place. And now there was no cozy bar where you could always enjoy live music, where there was a friendly, warm atmosphere. James would understand, support her. Everything was easier and more pleasant with him in general. But he was hundreds of kilometers away from her and seemed to have forgotten all about her. James had no idea how desperate she was. He never found out about the loan. He thought Julia had helped him with the extra money she'd suddenly received. And of course, he has no idea she's been fired. And if he did, what would he care about her now? Julia had no time to go over the offenses and think about how it would be if she desperately needed a job, and preferably in a decently paid. And so the girl tirelessly scored the ads. Wanted to find something that would help to get out of the financial hole. Well, at least the landlord agreed to wait with payment, but he's got a lot of patience, too. Julia will be asked to leave. This ad caught Julia's attention with the amount of money that was offered for the services. Not a bad figure. It could solve many of the girl's problems. But the job, the job itself seemed too unfamiliar to Julia. A nurse was needed for a little girl. The sort of unhealthy diagnosis didn't agree, but the person who gave the ad made it clear the child needed round-the-clock supervision and care including taking medication by the hour, accompanying her to procedures, and so on. Julia wondered. She had experience in caring for babies. Thanks, Helen, her conclusion. The girl even enjoyed fiddling with her nephews. She knew how to get along with small children, knew how to feed them, change their clothes, keep them occupied. But here we were talking about a sick child, a seriously ill one by the looks of it. Could she do it? At least it was worth a try. Julia called the given number, she was answered by a pleasant male voice. The man asked her several questions. Age, occupation, education, experience with small children, and she was invited for an interview. Julia was nervous the day before. She wanted the job. Julia needed it like air. It was a chance to get out of a financial hole, to stay afloat. Where else to find such a salary? That's why the girl was worried, worried about what if she was not taken. What then again to look for a place waitress? Labor for pennies. Cab brought Julia to the country cottage village. Elite neighborhood high, beautiful houses surrounded by fences. At the gate the girl met a woman, an au pair. As Julia found out later, and in fact a person who had everything on her plate. Cleaning, cooking, laundry. Because her employer William was always too busy. Businessmen in general have very little free time. William met the job applicants in the living room. He was a man in his 40s with intelligent, piercing blue eyes, perfectly styled hair with a slight square, an athletic figure. Yes, this man clearly paid attention to health and appearance. Juliet even cracked up at first. How to start a conversation with someone like this? To herself next to him, she suddenly seemed insignificant. Good morning. Warm. William smiled and Julia's embarrassment vanished. The man's smile was open, and the kind William seemed at once like a man of his own. Hello, 
Julia smiled back. I'm here through an ad for you. It's very good. I'll tell you right away. I need a nurse for my daughter Sophia. She is in a very serious condition now, so it's not for everyone. She's being monitored by the paramedics. They're here every day. I could hire a nurse for Sophia, but how can I tell you? There's already a lot of pain in her life, a lot of people in white coats. I wish there was someone else there for her. You know, a young girl like you, cheerful, who knows a lot of songs and fairy tales, who can cheer up a child, inspire him, come up with some interesting activity, in general, to brighten up her leisure time. Why? What's wrong with your girl? Julia just couldn't help but ask that question. Who would know? William lowered his eyes. His face grew darker in an instant, becoming anxious and tense. Sophia, it's been examined everywhere. No one could understand anything. It's like her body is destroying itself. No signs of autoimmune aggression. She's been getting tests all the time. They do, but she's fading and nothing helps her. Poor baby, Julia exclaimed. The doctors are doing what they can. I have the means, as you can see. But they are not all powerful, unfortunately. Anyway, Sophia needs more than just a nanny. We have Adriana, our favorite au pair. She will feed her, give her medications on time, and we don't just need a caregiver either. Sophia is supervised by nurses, they do all the necessary procedures. Sophia is needed soon. A friend, a person who can bring her positive emotions. The doctors say it's very important in her condition. And looking at you, it seems to me that you're young, beautiful, cheerful, and you have a kind look in your eye. You can empathize. That's good. Julia nodded. She wanted to see Sophia as soon as possible. If she needed positive emotions, she would provide them. Julia was sure to cheer up a girl who had such a serious illness. To brighten up the gray, everyday life of the little patient, we'll find a way to make her life more pleasant. If you're ready to get to work right now, William continued, let's start a trial period. Let's say three days, and then Sophia will decide. Of course, you will be paid for your time anyway. But do you agree? Yes, nodded Julia. Good, William asked. Then Adriana will introduce you to Sophia. And I'm off. Business. As the door shut behind William, Adriana, a middle-aged woman with a surprisingly soft and cozy look, turned to Julia with a question. I used to talk to babies. Do you know what little kids are like? I have nephews, Julia nodded. Is that a good thing? Adriana shook her head. But Sophia is ours, she's an unusual child. I've already realized that. I guess Sophia hardly ever gets out of bed, she gets tired quickly. It's hard to get her interested in anything, but you have to. Sophia needs to be distracted from her pain, from her agony. And she needs to walk at least an hour a day. That's what the doctors said. I get it. Well, now let's go meet her. Julia followed Adriana up to the second floor and entered the nursery. It was a spacious princess room. A huge window let in a lot of daylight. Along the walls were racks of expensive toys and books. Right in the center of the room was a mini playground. There was a slide, swings, and even a trampoline. A little farther away was a ball pool, and closer to the door was a bed. What kind of bed was it? A big, round one. Julia looked around curiously. She had never seen a room like this before. Was it all for one child? In the midst of this splendor Julia did not immediately notice the little mistress of the room. The girl was lying in bed surrounded by large stuffed toys. There was a cat baton, a fluffy white bear, a bright green crocodile with flowers all over his body, and a skinny pale seven-year-old girl, completely transparent and almost merged from the unhealthy color of her skin with the white bed linen. Huge blue eyes, like her father's, looked at the entrance with curiosity. Sophia raised herself up on her elbows, though it cost her great effort, and turned to Adriana. Who's that with you? The new rehabilitator. The difficult word came out of the little girl's mouth easily and habitually, and it felt unnatural. No, Bunny, this is your new friend. Her name is Julia. Will you play dolls together? Sophia got a little excited. Would you like to? I smiled at Julia. The girl evoked sympathy and pity. I like to play dolls very much. That's good. Adriana's not available. 
Can't daddy play at all? Adults have a lot to do, Julia shrugged. That's why they can be boring sometimes, Sophia suggested. And the conspirators smiled. Boring, agreed Julia. Sophia laughed quietly. Well, I can see you're going to be fine. Adriana looked genuinely happy. Did you have fun here? I'm going to make dinner. Oh, and Sophia, you remember the nurse is coming to see you today, right? I remember, the girl frowned. Again, IVs. But where to go? Sweet Adriana kissed the top of the girl's head and left the room. Julia was left alone with Sophia. Well, shall we play? The girl turned to her ward with a smile. You have so many beautiful toys here. I can't keep my eyes open. You'd better read to me, the girl asked. It seemed that the short conversation had taken the last of her strength. Sophia sank down on the pillows, pulled the blanket over her skinny body, although the room was warm. Good, Julia agreed. She was surprised and horrified by the weakness of this child of seven. They are also Azers, such as Larry, Julia's older nephew, he is just the same age as Sophia. But he can't even sit still for five minutes, he's always getting into things, figuring things out. If the boy was suddenly in this room, he would immediately start jumping on the trampoline or going down the slide. Helen calls him the perpetual motion machine and Molly. Christina and Christina are not lagging behind her brother, although they are younger. Sophia is lying there, poor thing. What do you want to read about princesses? There's a book on the windowsill. Vera started to read it to me, but she doesn't have time to read it. It was a heavy, beautiful book with bright pictures. But the story itself, it seemed Julia some kind of silly, boring, predictable, and formulaic. She herself as a child did not like such stories at all. And let's make up our own story about these princesses. As Julia I expected tired eyes Sophia flashed interest. How to do it, she clarified. Very simple. I start, you continue. Sophia was engrossed in the lesson. She was inspired to invent adventures for the princess. She would ride in her racing car. Then the heroine would be kidnapped by a dragon and then rescued by the prince. The girl's imagination was running wild, which seemed to surprise Sophia herself. Then Adriana entered the room. Seeing that Julia and Sophia were getting along, she was pleased. The woman brought a lunch of mashed soup and stewed vegetables. Sophia grumbled. I don't want it, she said. I don't want to eat at all. I don't want any of this. Adriana looked at Julia. The woman was clearly waiting for her help. Let me feed you. Julia turned to Sophia. Each spoonful. Another princess adventure. I'll make them up as I go along. Can you imagine the stories I'll have to tell you? What do you think will finish your food or my fantasy first? It worked. The food ended faster than Julia's fantasy, but Sophia demanded more story. Adriana splayed out her hands in surprise, smiled and walked out. Soon a nurse, Sophia, entered the nursery, immediately on the gloomy one. She was almost asleep by now. Lunch and the story had tired her out, but it was time for treatments. IVs, hopelessly asked the girl to the nurse. She nodded sympathetically. I'll do it quickly. Don't worry, it won't hurt. You sleep later, and we'll have tea. Adriana pulled Julia by the sleeve. Aren't you needed here now? The au pair led Julia into the spacious kitchen, smoking cups of coffee and a flavorful cake that looked like it had just come out of the oven were waiting on the table. You, Sophia, and I see you're getting along. The woman smiled, looking warmly at Julia. That's good. Sophia had kicked out the previous nanny, but he's taken to you right away. I've already called William and told him all about it. He's very pleased and excited. He told me to take good care of you. I'm glad too. Julia smiled. Sophia is just a pity. My nephews are so noisy, so cheerful. She is lying on the bed. She can't even play. She has nothing to play with. It's scary. That's what the doctors say. There's a chance. No prognosis. Adriana shook her head. They can't even diagnose anything. They just treat the symptoms, that's all. Sophia will be better now after the drip. Take her for a walk after her afternoon nap for a while. William, the girl's father. I get that. Where's her mom? On a business trip. She has a demanding job too, that's why she can't babysit. I wish, Adriana sighed. Is Betty ours? She's gone. 
it was a difficult labor. The doctors tried to save the baby and didn't notice that the mother needed help. And she herself, Helen, didn't complain to them about anything, she was worried about the baby. But that's how it turned out. The day after the birth Betty had a high fever, checkup, ICU this and that. Her heart stopped. Poor thing had some kind of internal bleeding. It's a rare case. And then there was Sophia in the NICU. She was born prematurely. It was a tough time. That's a shame. That's a shame, Adriana agreed. Let me tell you the whole story. Looks like you're gonna be here for a while. So you should know. William grew up in a well-to-do, close-knit family. A loving mom and dad, caring, attentive grandparents, a room of his own. Trips to the seaside every summer, birthdays, friends. William had a happy childhood, an equally happy youth. He graduated from high school with a gold medal. Thanks in large part to parents who cared about their son's education. If they saw gaps, they immediately hired William the best tutors and foreign languages and the boy studied in foreign camps and rest and education at once. Vouchers to such places were not cheap and it was not easy to get them. But what can't you do for the sake of your favorite son, especially if he is so desirable and long awaited? William had rather old parents. They did not get a child for many years. The couple resigned, was with such a fate. But then, when there was no hope left, life suddenly threw a surprise gave the couple an heir. Needless to say, all of his mother's and father's attention from then on belonged undividedly to William. William was never shy of his parents. Yes, he saw his mother and father much older than the relatives of his classmates. But the boy, on the contrary, was proud of them because William's father was a well-known businessman in the city, and his mother was the head doctor of the regional hospital. Everyone knew them, everyone respected them. It never occurred to William to be ashamed of his family. William grew up. His parents were rapidly becoming obsolete, giving up. When the guy was in his third year of university, his father died. Stroke, intensive care, coma, and all. William then for the first time felt like an adult, you bet, because he, a student, had to get into the affairs of the company, which his parents left the guy by inheritance. It was William, a teenager, who was interested in his father's business. He knew a lot, even had the right to sign. And yet still at first, he entrusted most of the processes to the manager of the board, a longtime friend of his departed parent. Because William needed to study and support his mother, who had given up a lot after the death of her spouse. Three years passed. William had just gotten his degree, just taken over his father's company, just starting to gain momentum. And then there's another blow. Mom this time. The kid was all alone. William felt miserable and lonely in his parents' big house. At least Adriana, the au pair and almost a member of the family, was there. She had known William as a baby and treated him as her son. The woman had no children of her own, she gave all her care to the young man, who had lost both his parents one after the other. It was hard on him, Adriana shook her head. Just a boy, but also. Work had pulled him through then. He had to decide something, to go somewhere, to hold meetings, to make contracts, and so on. That's what saved him back then. Time passed. William went from a young, inexperienced guy to a smart guy. A grip on the man, a talented businessman. Adriana rejoiced, looking at her ward. He grew older, stronger, more confident. The au pair wanted William to find a good wife, marry her, and become a father. Then her heart would be at peace. Adriana was calm. Only he had no one in particular. Adriana said. No, there were some girls hanging around William. He's a good-looking guy, wealthy. They're always on the prowl. But I met with one of them, and I didn't see anything wrong with the other. I didn't like them as counselors, and I didn't like them either. It seemed like they only wanted money from him. He's got a tail on his head. And then, then Betty showed up. William met Betty literally on the street. She was walking down the sidewalk in a hurry. Turns out she was going to a job interview at William's firm. Betty had recently been downsized. The factory where she had worked for several years, after the institute as an accountant, had suddenly closed. So Betty was looking for a new position, and William went out for a walk, to
to clear his head. He even had a goal to buy donuts at the bakery around the corner. And that's when fate knocked the young people head-on literally. Helen jumped out of the corner too quickly and ran into the unsuspecting William. It was like something out of a romantic music video. The bag slipped off Betty's shoulder and the contents scattered on the pavement. William and Betty rushed to pick it up. Did the girl harbor words of apology? William assured her it was okay and admired the girl's beautiful gray eyes. It was love at first sight. When the young people sorted out the bag and the things that had spilled out of it, they rose synchronously and smiled at each other. Well, William, as a man, made the first step learn the name of the beautiful stranger and then introduced himself. They walked leisurely and talked and got acquainted. When William found out that Betty was rushing to his office, he asked and immediately realized that this beautiful girl was his destiny. And it was not by chance that they met in such an interesting way. Rather than seeing each other for the first time in the office, it was more romantic, more interesting, more enjoyable. All in all, a real romance was brewing. Adriana had never seen William so happy. Betty turned out to be intelligent, understanding, kind. She and Adriana, and importantly, quickly found a common language. Sweet, sweet girl. And for what? And only such a fate. Sadly shook her head Adriana. A couple of years after their acquaintance William and Betty got married. It was a wonderful couple, harmonious, happy. There was love, mutual understanding and respect between the couple. I am sure that her heart rejoiced when she saw them together her beloved. After all, Vanya, his wonderful, beautiful wife. Here with children both decided not to hurry. Adriana continued the story. It was their common decision, as if they felt something. They traveled, worked, met with friends. And I, the fool, all in the old man's way. I advised them not to wait too long. I wanted to nurse their baby. But William and Betty lived on their own for five years after they were married. Were they happy together? No, they wanted kids, but not right away later while they were happy with everything. And then the news of Betty's pregnancy. It was an unplanned event, but the whole household welcomed it with joy. Well, then it was time, Betty summarized. The baby had decided he'd had enough of waiting. Thank God. Adriana threw up her hands. I think you're having a boy. You're very beautiful, Betty. Girls take away their mother's beauty during pregnancy. But the au pair was wrong. The ultrasound confirmed that Betty was expecting a girl. A big, strong one. They showed me a picture of her. They take pictures of a baby in the womb now. And when I looked at it, it looked just like Betty. That's how our Sophia was born, just like her mommy. Sophia. It was Betty who chose the name for her daughter. William and Adriana didn't mind. They both liked it very much. The pregnancy didn't go too easily. At first, Betty was suffering from toxicosis. Then it seemed to subside, but it was replaced by other problems such as high blood pressure and swelling. The child was developing well, but the mother was suffering melting before her eyes, refusing to eat, lying down a lot. The usually energetic Betty lacked the strength even to go downstairs. Adriana carried her food directly to her bedroom. The woman felt sorry for Betty, helped her in any way she could, and assured her that everything would go away after her daughter was born. Children aren't easy for women, Adriana sighed. Pregnancy had taken its toll on Betty. Who's to say? Julia shrugged, remembering her sister. Both of them had gotten babies relatively easily. Anyway, Betty went into labor much earlier than she should have. The whole pregnancy was threatened, so fortunately, the mother-to-be was in the hospital under the supervision of doctors at that moment. They tried to stop the process, but failed. Sophia was born prematurely. Weak she did not scream. She was not placed on Alina's chest, not even shown to her. When it comes to newborns who need to stay in the womb for at least three more months, things are different. Sophia was immediately sent to the intensive care unit. The fight for her life began. And Betty and Lena seemed to be fine at first. Well, tired, of course, after childbirth. Well, anxious. She couldn't find a place for her daughter. It's all understandable, all explainable, and natural. The doctors examined the woman in labor found no abnormalities and sent her to the ward. 
Afterwards, serious symptoms appeared, but it was too late. William and I were all worried about the girl. Adriana almost cried. It was obvious that even now, seven years later, it was hard for her to remember it all. They thought that the little girl would not survive, she was born too early, she was very weak. And then, when William received a call from the hospital in the morning and was told that his wife had died of internal bleeding, he could not believe his ears. It seemed to him that it was Sophia. His mind refused to accept what he was hearing. But no, Sophia had made it. Stronger was the girl. Betty, on the other hand, was not. William, then the gray one walked around, didn't sleep or eat for months. I thought he was going to die too, but he went away. I had to work, I had to pull Sotnikova through. To be perfectly honest, he didn't treat his daughter well at first. Blamed her for what happened to Lena. He knew it was wrong. But he couldn't help it, he was angry with her, that's all. Sophia was discharged home. They hired a nanny for her. Someone had to look after the baby. Adriana was too old for that, but she enjoyed playing. Sophia took her around the yard in her stroller and talked to her a lot. And she was the only one who gave the newborn the love she needed. My father was not capable of that at that time. She is like a granddaughter to me, smiled the au pair. I accepted her immediately. But William he long shunned the child. Bought for her everything necessary and sometimes went for a walk with her. And that was if I made him. He didn't take the initiative himself. And then one day Sophia got sick, the temperature was high. Nothing helped. She was throwing up. It was the flu. It plagued a lot of people back then. And the little ones took it especially hard. But anyway, Sophia went to the hospital again. The doctors didn't give any prognosis. And that's when William came to his senses, gave up everything. He sat by his daughter's bedside singing songs and singing, telling poems, rocking her in his arms, and Sophia. It was as if she felt her father's care. She was on the mend immediately. Our little girl was discharged and William became a real father, loving and caring. Life went on as usual. William worked a lot, but always found time to spend with his daughter. Sophia grew up, pleased her father and Adriana with her excellent health and rare intelligence. And everything seemed to be fine. But Adriana was worried that William was all alone. It seemed to her that there would be no happiness for him until he met a woman. Only now it was a very difficult task. Chosen by William, she had to love and accept. Sophia. Otherwise a union was out of the question. Well, God heard my prayers, Adriana smiled. And William had Lucy, the beautiful Lucy. I can't take my eyes off her. She's smart too. She's got a baby herself, a little girl a little younger than Sophia. It's a great family. Lucy got a job with William, and it all started at a corporate party. So, it's the usual story. Lucy was very good to Sophia. She often took her and her youngest daughter somewhere to an amusement park or to the movies. Sophia loved both Lucy and her little half-sister Nancy. She was truly happy. William and Lucy got married and started living together. Then Sophia started having these symptoms. First, dizziness, then nausea, weakness, lack of appetite. Examination in the best clinics, trips to doctors abroad, consultations with famous professors, all this did not give any result. Doctors could not diagnose the girl was melting before their eyes. The first year she was still on her feet. Adriana almost cried again. It was obvious that her heart was truly hurting for the little girl. After New Year's Eve she had gotten very ill, and now she was so afraid for her. And it is not clear what kind of illness attacked our little girl. Lucy and her daughter temporarily moved into her own apartment. Just Nancy went to the garden to carry infections from there, and for Sophia all this was extremely dangerous. So Lucy and William made that decision. And it comes from Lucy a lot, every day almost. She's good, Sophia is fair. They bring her goodies. They bring Nancy too, sometimes, when she's not sick. When she started kindergarten it started. Sick day after sick day, so they have a wife with one child separately, and a husband with their eldest daughter separately. That's the family. Well, what can I do? That's the situation. It's a strange situation, Julia said. She was shocked by the story of William and Sophia. You could make a TV series. 
Well, that's just the way it is. The old woman waved her hands. Sophia, I can see that you get along, and that's good. Everything will be more pleasant with you. The days went by. Julia now lived in the room next to Sophia's nursery. But the girl often asked the nanny to stay overnight in her bedroom. Sophia had a very comfortable sofa there. Julia lay down on it. They talked before going to bed, holding hands. Julia saw Sophia. It was very important. The girl clearly lacked attention, even though there were many adults around her. William was a very caring and anxious father and a pleasant person to be around. They often had conversations about Sophia. The man always listened attentively to Julia, did not interrupt or argue, and asked the right questions. Julia also got to know Lucy. Adriana was right. Indeed, she was a very beautiful woman. Chiseled cheekbones, beautifully curved lips, the grace of a panther, a real queen. But when Lucy interacted with Sophia, when she was adjusting the blanket on the girl, she smiled and stroked the little girl's head. Julia couldn't shake the feeling that the woman was faking it. It was evident in seemingly insignificant details. The cold glint of her eyes, the squeamish movement of her lips, something elusive and very unpleasant. One day Julia had a strange dream. The girl found herself in some room stripped wallpaper, creaking, twigs, floors. She sat on a stool by a dark window, through which nothing was visible, and realized that she was asleep. She wanted to wake up, but for some reason she couldn't. And then Julia did not even realize where she had come from. Betty appeared in front of her as if out of thin air. Julia recognized her because she had seen Sophia's mother in pictures. Betty smiled sadly and looked at Julia with a warm and very soft gaze. Watch her, she said in a quiet, illogical voice. Watch out for Lucy, she's trouble, she's dangerous. Betty vanished into thin air and Julia had so many questions she wanted to ask her. How to keep an eye on her on what? What is she dangerous? Julia woke up in a cold sweat. Or rather, as if she'd flown into her body, fallen into it. It felt strange. Betty's words were still echoing in her head. No, Julia didn't believe in the supernatural. But the dream, which was little more than a dream, was more like a journey through time and worlds. The strange dream wouldn't let go. The next day Lucy was gone, and Julia waited for her. She knew for a fact that this woman was involved in something bad. Lucy is somehow hurting this family and doesn't like Sophia. She doesn't sympathize with the girl. She just pretends to care. And how come the others don't notice this, even the experienced, long-lived Adriana? Lucy showed up the next day, beautiful as always, brightly made up languid. First thing she did was go up to Sophia to say hello. Then she went down to the kitchen. Sophia is thirsty, Lucy said, looking at Adriana. Let me make her some cocoa. Come on, I fussed, the au pair. No, I can manage. I feel like it. I want to do something for her. You're so thoughtful. Julia was silent. She was watching Lucy like Betty had asked her to in the dream. For some reason it felt like this was the big moment. It was as if Betty was there, telling her to be vigilant. Adriana was tending to the dough. Julia pretended to look out the window, but she was watching Lucy. And then there was Tanya. The woman deftly pulled a small vial out of her sleeve, dripped a few drops from there into the milk, and immediately hid the bottle back. Only a couple seconds, a few deft movements, but Julia saw everything. The drink for the princess is ready. Lucy smiled. Julia, give me her favorite cup, please. Julia obeyed. She silently watched as Lucy poured what felt like a mug Sophia glasses, with the image of characters of the girl's favorite cartoon. And I realized Sophia shouldn't drink it. She shouldn't. She must act. Julia pretended to slip. She bumped into Lucy, who dropped the cup from her hands. The glass fell and shattered. What spilled out onto the floor? I'm sorry, I'm so clumsy. Julia fussed, grabbed a rag, started wiping, undoing the puddle, picking up the shards. It's okay, I'll do more. In the voice of Lucy sounded poorly concealed irritation. Julia could not do it a second time. It would arouse suspicion. So she had to accept the fact that Sophia would get the cocoa from her stepmother's hands. While Lucy and Adriana were at Sophia's place, 
Julia squeezed the rag she used to wipe the cocoa into an empty tomato paste jar. She was going to take the liquid to be analyzed today. I and needed to know exactly what Lucy put in the cocoa. Maybe it was just vitamins. Then there was no point in panicking. But something told the girl it wasn't. She had to wait two days for the test results. When Julia saw the statement, she was horrified. The drink contained a deadly poison, causing symptoms similar to those of Sophia. So the girl's weakness was due to her stepmother systematically poisoning her. Just like in a fairy tale, Julia didn't know who to turn to with her news. Adriana, what can she do? William, he wouldn't believe her. What to do? Lucy can't be allowed near the girl anymore. She wants to send her to the grave and she's almost succeeded. And yet Julia has the courage to talk to William. She told him everything about her terrible dream, about the cocoa, and about the examination. Julia was afraid that he would yell at her, call her out, kick her out, or what's more, accuse her of wanting to hurt his daughter. You know William said, looking at Julia, I would. I'd probably fire you immediately after saying that. It's very strange, you have to admit. But just yesterday, I had an unusual dream too. Betty, she asked me to trust you just to trust you, nothing more. Why don't you just keep this to yourself and take a vacation? I need to sort this out. Adriana will call you when you can go back to work. Julia spent those few days on pins and needles. She didn't know what was going on at William's house, and she was worried about Sophia, who had already become attached to her. But William had said to wait for the call, so she would wait. Adriana called Julia when she saw her name on the screen. Worried about what she would be told, how did it go? Come on over. All Adriana could do was extort. We're in the middle of something. Come over soon. Sophia misses you. Very much. Julia didn't have to beg long. Half an hour later she was already at William's house. The owner himself opened the door, still as calm and unruffled as ever. His appearance made it hard to guess what had happened. I want to thank you. The man finally allowed himself to smile. You were right. Lucy. She really wanted to. I'm afraid to say it out loud. Sophia wanted to poison that bastard. Adriana didn't bother. That's a lot to think about. I already trusted her. The story turned out to be banal and old as the world stick. Lucy was not going to put up with a rival in the form of her wealthy husband's favorite daughter. She wanted her own daughter Nancy to be the sole heir to William's entire fortune. Well, first she herself, of course. Lucy had once studied to be a pharmacist. However, she never worked a day in her profession, preferring to live off rich admirers. Nature generously gave her beauty, so that the opportunities for such an existence, the woman had. Received in college knowledge was enough to think of a way to send the hated stepdaughter to the other world. A poison and a poison that is difficult to detect in blood, tissue unless specifically looked for. Lucy poured the toxic substance into the food she cooked for Sophia. And the girl weakened, slowly fading away. There was nothing left to do. It doesn't make sense. Unbelievable. Everything Adriana couldn't calm down. Julia understood her. Indeed, Lucy's act was monstrous. How could she do that to a defenseless child? Sophia trusted her, loved her. So William installed surveillance cameras in the kitchen. It turned out that Lucy was putting poison in Sophia's food every time. Sometimes she cooked something for the girl herself, and sometimes she managed to drip from a vial into the food, probably cooked in it. I used my own hands to take it to Sophia, the poison. Anyway, Lucy was caught red-handed. She was now under investigation. Nancy had been taken by her father, a man who had wanted to communicate with the child for a long time, but was prevented from doing so because he was too poor to do so, too unworthy. Sophia, and everything will be fine, Adriana assured her. The child was not to blame for what his mother wanted to create. And Sophia, how is she? Sophia is fine. There was a ringing voice from behind her. Julia turned around and met Sophia's eyes. She was still very thin and pale, but she had the strength to walk around the house. A real miracle. The doctor said she would recover quickly. Julia. James walked slowly along the shelves of the children's store. It was a section for girls, 
so it seemed to both of them as if they were in the realm of pink and purple. Dolls, baby cosmetics, soft toys. It was mind-boggling. When I was in Europe, a guy bought his nephew a voice-activated robot. This is the thing. Maybe Sophia would like something like that. She's a girl, reminds me of Julia. And she definitely wants a cartoon character doll. We should try to find one. Maybe next birthday she won't want toys at all. Kids grow up so fast, it's amazing. We'll soon see for ourselves. James put his hand on Julia's rounded belly. The baby responded immediately with a still weak but tangible kick. A year ago, right after Sophia had been rescued from her evil stepmother, Julia had been in for another surprise. She continued to live close to Sophia. Sophia was recovering quickly, mastering active games, asking to take her for walks all over the city. The girl was still very attached to Julia, and that one still needed a job, and Julia had gotten used to everyone. To the girl Adriana, even William did not want to part with them. The adults initially decided not to tell Sophia the truth about what had happened to her. It was too scary a story, but the sensible girl managed to put two and two together, listened to something, thought of something. The story itself did not have a strong destructive effect on her, as adults feared. Sophia took everything quite calmly. Everything is just like in fairy tales, the girl shrugged her shoulders. The little girl was coming back to life. In September, she went to school with her peers. And Julia was finally able to recover at the university, chose a correspondence department, because she had to not only study, but also work. However, her work was more like living in a family with her relatives. Sweet, cheerful Sophia. Kind, wise Vera Petrovna. Always busy, but polite and attentive William. With these people Julia was cozy, warm and comfortable. They took her in still and were very grateful to her for her rescue. Sophia. It is scary to think what could have happened if not for that terrible dream. They discussed this unusual event. First Betty had dreamed about Julia, then about William. Adriana was sure Betty had broken through time and worlds to save her daughter. William only shook his head and did not give his opinion. And Julia, she didn't know what to think. Perhaps Lucy had aroused her suspicions at once. After all, she had not liked Sophia's stepmother at first sight. More likely, Julia was running through the thoughts in her head. It is possible that they were transformed into unusual dreams. Except that William also dreamed Betty and asked him to believe. Julia found it more difficult to explain. That day, Julia left the house alone. Sophia was doing her homework. Adriana was doing chores around the house. Julia had to drive to the university to bring some documents to the dean's office. Suddenly, James stepped toward her. Julia couldn't believe her eyes from the Chantanou hair. And him? He looked happy and confused, smiling, looking at Julia as if there was no one more important to him in this world. At last I found you, he said, and without delay he pressed her against him. Julia did not understand anything, but she did not resist. She pressed against her lover, enjoyed his closeness, and tried not to think about James's betrayal, about his sudden disappearance. The explanation turned out to be ridiculously simple James simply dropped his phone into the ocean during a walk on a steamer. Naturally, the gadget disappeared irretrievably. Julia was not registered in social networks, so he simply could not contact her. No way, James wrote letters, like in the good old days of letters and telegrams. But Julia had moved in with William and was hardly ever home. So the letters piled up in the mailbox and then for some reason disappeared. Julia remembered this moment. One day she came home and saw that the mailbox door was broken. Someone had opened the box and taken the letters for some reason. Maybe the kids. Maybe. A nosy neighbor. In short, Julia hadn't heard from James, so she assumed he'd forgotten about her. Started a new life. Betrayed her. I couldn't just drop everything and leave. It was about my career and our future, our well-being. Without you, without news of you, it was unbearable. But I knew I would have to wait, and then financially I would be able to provide for us for many years to come. And then I could fly to you and explain everything. I had no idea. You're in some kind of dire straits. I didn't know you had to take out a loan. I didn't know you'd been laid off. It's been so hard on you. 
that's it. Just an unfortunate set of circumstances. Julia was glad that her feelings and James' feelings were real. That there was no betrayal or deception in her life. Just a misunderstanding that had finally been resolved. James now had a contract with a well-known producer in the capital. He had everything he dreamed of concerts, gigs, tours, opportunities to take his music to people who were ready to accept it. And money? Money, of course. James was even able to buy an apartment for the two of them. It was in the middle of a renovation. James and Julia got married. They were already expecting a child. Julia felt happy and loved. She no longer worked for William. And a grown-up Sophia didn't need a 24-hour nanny to take care of her. But they all remained friends. And right now Julia and James were picking out a ninth birthday present for Sophia that might not have been.